Well, let's bow our heads and join our hearts together in prayer now. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the wonderful world that you have made, for all that you've given us to enjoy. And we thank you that you have not left us to feel our way around in the darkness of ignorance and confusion, but have given us the clear shining light of the scriptures to teach us true knowledge of you and a true understanding of how to live and how to think. We commit every part of this day to you now and pray that you will uphold those who are speaking and that you will strengthen all of us, giving us joy and grace and the power to persevere. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Willie. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you have uh, two handouts. There is the text of Genesis chapter 1 with some emphases uh, for us, and then a bit of an outline of where we hope to go today. We began uh, yesterday by asking questions of the text that I think the text and the context itself uh, demand of us. And I think we recognize that this text uh, wasn't written, at least primarily, or firstly, it wasn't written uh, to critique 21st century uh, sciences. It wasn't written, I think, to provide fodder for, I think, what is often a fruitless discussion about matters like the age of the earth uh, and so on. But it was written by Moses for God's people Israel, and it was to teach them more about the God whom they already knew as their covenant redeemer, as their Lord. And it was to teach them that he, their Lord, their God, is the only sovereign creator of all things. And we saw, I think, that Genesis is a very powerful polemic. That is, from the start, it is a frontal assault on all other accounts, all other ancient myths and stories, and indeed all modern ideologies. And it tells us that the God of creation in the beginning created the heavens and the earth and no other. This world is not a chance happening, uh, whether through the collision of uh, ancient gods in the skies or the collision of ancient atoms. Nor is the world governed by sex, as if it came to be through Bizarre unions, sexual unions of the gods in the skies, as though sex is somehow, therefore, primary and defining uh, of humanity to be worshipped. Nor is the world defined by mere luck, as though humans are enslaved to uh, uh, charms and rituals and religions uh, and so on, things to placate the, the capriciousness of the gods and of the spirits. No, all of that, all of that mumbo-jumbo, is swept aside uh, by the first chapter of Genesis as it declares that the whole universe is created and is governed by a sovereign God, a God of power and order and purpose who gives this world and who gives our human lives, therefore, order and meaning and purpose and therefore value and hope. Gives us a future which is sure, which is certain in his hands. And so the purpose of this chapter is not, I think, to lead us down blind alleys of speculation, but rather it's to lead us to bow before the person of the creator, the God of creation. But not only that, you see, because Genesis 1 reveals to us the God of creation, but it also reveals to us the sheer glory of that creation. It's led not, uh, it's there so that we're not just led to bow to his person, but it's there to lead us to rejoice in his praise. Psalm 95 begins by calling us to worship, to bow down, to kneel before the Lord, our maker. But not to do that grudgingly, not with cold hearts. No, come, sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Come into his presence with thanksgiving. Psalm 104 that we read part of tells us that the Lord rejoices in his works. And it calls us to rejoice with him in those works. 
And that is what Genesis chapter 1 is meant to produce in us. It's meant to produce a sense of awe at the sheer glory of God's creation. It's written to lead us to rejoice in his praise. And that purpose, I think, becomes very obvious as we look at how it's written, how the story of creation is told. And it is a remarkable uh, literary masterpiece. I want to try and uh, draw attention to three things I think that the writer uh, shows us to express creation's glory. And first of all, he shows us that God has carefully ordered the world that he's created. You can't read, I think, Genesis 1 uh, without being struck by the care, the precision, the order of everything that God does in creation. And the reason for that is that the very structure of the account itself is actually part of the message. It's not just haphazard. We don't just get a summary. God created everything, and then a sort of random list of a few of those things. It's, it's absolutely the reverse of that. I've put on the, on the sheet there for you the text so that you can get some sense of just how carefully ordered it has been by Moses. And the intricacy uh, of that structure itself, it speaks eloquently, I think, of the the intricate and the detailed order of every single facet of God's created order. Let's look briefly at the, at the form of the whole section. Verse 1 uh, is really a title. It's a summary of everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in a sense, you don't need any more than that. That's it all. But there is more than that, isn't there? Verse 2, homes and on the earth. Now the earth. Now let's focus on the earth, he's saying. The earth is the realm of humanity, so that is the focus. And the focus, you see, is all on the ordering from a primitive, discordant chaos into a mature and harmonious and ordered cosmos. So we go from the, the darkness and the watery deep of verse 2, which is entirely without form, it's void, it's empty. And we go from that so at the bottom of the sheet, verses 1 to 3 of chapter 2, which is a completed cosmos, heavens and earth. The formlessness has now been fully formed, and the empty void has been filled with all the host of them. And we have a place of rest and of peace and of blessing and of holiness. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Now that is in total contrast to all these other ancient Babylonian and Egyptian myths that all these uh, Israelite readers would have known. They're all full of stories of the gods fighting and struggling, of a totally unplanned fallout to the earth, creating a world that actually is in turmoil, of men at odds with the gods, of the gods at odds and fighting with the monsters of the sea and so on. Now here is something quite different, plan and purpose creating order and harmony. And God does it all. He does it effortlessly, just by speaking. And he does it with beautiful, with perfect order. Everything is in its place, just as it should be. And the chaos of verse 2 is utterly resolved into the cosmic peace of the beginning of chapter 2. And you see how these verses in between um, uh, are totally focused on that perfect ordering. First of all, there's the deliberate ordering that draws attention to God's powerful word, answering and overwhelming all the problems of uh, chapter 1, verse 2. So verse 2, the earth is without form. It's engulfed in the darkness, in the deep, the waters. It's void. It's an empty, barren waste. But that's not all there is, because the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. So what's going to happen? What can this God do? Will this God be able to do anything? Well, they have to fight with these forces of chaos and evil. As in the pagan mythologies, that's what happens. Is there any possibility that this God can do anything faced with such a, an enormous power of darkness and chaos? Well, the answer is this. Chaos and darkness and the empty deep are not his foes. They're just his subjects. And at his word, as the hymn says, chaos and darkness heard and took their flight. With one act, verses 3 to 5, darkness is dealt with. Let there be light as the dawn of day. And then with two more acts, the waters are dealt with. Verse 6, first there's a vertical separation, an atmosphere above and sea below. And then verse 9, there's a horizontal separation to produce dry land. 
And then with three more acts from verses 14 uh, and following, the emptiness is filled. And it's all by the word. It's all by the simple command of this God. And God said, and it was so. All three of those problems of verse 2 are totally resolved just with a word. Or to be more exact, with ten spoken words. Ten times God said, and it was so. That's a pretty significant number, don't you think? For a people who at Sinai had received precisely ten spoken words. The words of the Decalogue, the words of the covenant. Exodus 34, verse 28. So do you see the pattern? One command, and God said, on day one, and day two, and two commands on day three. And then one command on day four, and day five, and four commands on day six. And that brings us to the, to the second feature, you see, of this deliberate ordering of the days. And that's the correspondence between these two triads of days. Days one to three, and days four to six highlighted in green some of those things on the text to try and uh, make it stand out. And again, you see the, the, the two descriptions of the earth in verse 2, formless and void, empty. Well, days 1 to 3, what we have is the forming of what is formless. And days 4 to 6, we have the filling of what was empty. And that's careful parallelism because in day 1, we have the light formed. On day 4, we have the lights which give the light. Day two is the forming of the sky and the sea. And on day five is the filling of the sky and the sea with the fish and with the birds. Day three, we have the land and the vegetation form, the food of the earth. And day six, well, it fills the land with animals and with man who are going to eat that food. And that parallelism is so obvious. That's been noted from the very earliest days of the church. Augustine uh, wrote extensively on that. And it's there for a clear purpose. And it's to speak, isn't it, of the deliberate and also the delightful order of God's creation. There's all sorts of other features you begin to notice as you study it. The number seven uh, is clearly very significant, not just in the seven days, but seven times, God says, and it was so, seven times, and God saw it was good. The seven words in the first sentence in Hebrew. There's twice seven words in the second sentence in Hebrew, and on it goes. Number 10 is very significant. Number three, ten times, and God said, ten times each thing according to its kind. There's exactly 70 mentions of the names of God in Genesis 1 to 4. And on and on as you look at the text, so many signs of this careful structure and order. And I think all of these things together suggest to us that the overwhelming focus in the creation account is not so much being obsessed with chronology, but it is focused very carefully on order, on design, on purpose, on care, in all of God's laying out of his uh, created order, that what God says will be so. Now, none of that, I think, means that the days of creation can't be 24-hour days, but I do think, I do think that if it means that that is all we're taken up with, if chronology is what we're really taken up with, we really are missing the main point that is being told in so many different ways in these chapters. And we might well be ignoring some of the other, arguably much more dominant features like the ten words, which I think do dominate this chapter. The main message is to see, is to understand that God has created this world with a design and with an order, that it's under control, that it's good, that it's wonderful, because our God is the maker of all things in heaven and in earth. Now, let me try and draw you to two obvious, uh, I think, implications of this. First of all, because God created an ordered world, then that means human beings can investigate it and observe it and make discoveries about it and build assumptions on those based on the things that they do see and they do discover, things about its predictability, about its order. And that allows us to harness that knowledge in order to enhance our human lives. In other words, what I'm saying is, human science is possible. If the world wasn't ordered with intelligence, with design, with stability, if it was all just chance and chaos and disorder, that would not be so. If it were all pagan mumbo-jumbo, if things happened just at the capricious whims of the gods, well, you wouldn't really want to get in a car, would you? Far less in an airplane. 
Because how would you know? You'd have no idea if it was going to stay in the air or not. But you see, science is possible precisely because of the order built into God's creation. And of course, science as we know it grew out of that fully Christian worldview. Think of people like um, Kepler, who was one of the key figures of the, the scientific revolution of the 17th century. He was the one who described the laws of planetary motion and so on. And he said, what we're doing is thinking God's thoughts after him. You see, science depends upon order and predictability of an ordered cosmos. And the Bible gives us confidence that because God is the sole creator, well, these same natural laws that we observe in our world will exist all throughout our solar system and beyond. That's what gives you the confidence to go in a rocket into space or into the moon or wherever it is. And we have that confidence, don't we, because God is unchanging. Because his faithfulness is in his creation. That's why it can be depended upon. That's why planes won't suddenly fall out of the sky because the laws of gravity and the, 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 the laws of fluid mechanics and all of these things I don't understand that keep planes in the sky, they're not going to change between today and tomorrow, which you'll be very thankful for if you're going off on holiday at the end of the week, I'm sure. Christian faith was the womb of modern science. In fact, you see, it's radical scientism. The idea that despises nothing but randomness and total chance, that is actually the enemy of real science. Because if the goalposts might randomly shift, well, how can you possibly have a sure foundation for any of the empirical sciences? You can't. It's the order of creation that makes human science possible. And secondly, you see, it's the order of creation that makes human security possible, indeed promised. It's striking, isn't it, how, how anxiety and fear of global catastrophe was, uh, is such a mark now of, uh, of our modern secularism. But that is exactly what marked ancient paganism. They worried all the time that the, the, the capricious gods might plunder the world, plunge the world into chaos, plunge the world back into the darkness and the deep, that the waters would engulf the earth. No one could have any control over its future. Not that different nowadays, is it? The fear of global warming. Well, that, the name's had to be changed, hasn't it, to climate change because the globe isn't actually warming very fast anymore. But that's become the great issue for humanity. Fear of chaos, fear of rising waters, although they're not rising when you actually measure them. Fear of melting sea ice caps, although they're not actually melting when you actually measure them. When you put your ideologies into your computers and produce models, then they do. But all of these things we fear, the Bible says, no. What did we read in the psalm? This world is established. It shall never be moved. Because God has created it, but with order on a firm foundation. That's what Psalm 104 says. Indeed, his very creation is an act of covenant. It is a promise that he will not break. Jeremiah 33 says, Only if I've not established my covenant with day and night, and the fixed order of heaven and earth. Only then will I reject my offspring Jacob and David my servant. See, what he's saying is rejecting my people is as impossible as the foundation of creation being done away with and being rejected. It cannot be. It is God's promise. It's his covenant. So we don't need to live in fear of cosmic disaster. Of course, that doesn't mean there won't be floods and droughts and hurricanes and so on, as there have always been. Of course, it doesn't mean that we are to misuse the planet or have no care for it or not be responsible for the environment and so on. Genesis 1 tells us the exact opposite of that. We are to steward the earth for God, of course. But it does mean, it does mean that no Christian should live obsessed with climate catastrophe as though that were the major issue for the human race. If the Christian church jumps on that bandwagon and forgets the real issue for the human race, which is the judgment of God at the return of Jesus Christ, which the gospel of Christ alone can save people from, then that really will be calamity and catastrophe for the world. Now, God has made an ordered world. He has a covenant with the fixed order of heaven and earth. And we can have security. We don't need to be terrorized either by 
ancient paganism or by contemporary paganism. God ordered the world he created, and Genesis 1 exudes that divine ordering. But that ordering is not arbitrary, and that's the second thing, and the second focus here, because God has ordered the creation for mankind. The principal focus, indeed the climax of the creation account, is the creation of mankind. And that's abundantly obvious in Genesis 1 in all kinds of ways. It's the last creative act on day 6. It's the longest part of the text, verses 26 to 31, concerned with it. It's the only place where God announces beforehand, let us make, and then does. And it's only after man's creation you notice that God pronounces the world not just good, but very good. Now, we're going to come back uh, to the creation of man next time. But I want you to see how whole of the rest of the creation account is also ordered with a focus on humanity. See, the Bible's whole view of the created world is anthropocentric. It's human-centered. That, and that is, we have to, I think... Recognize that is the total opposite of uh, the worldview of many green campaigners today. Because they think that the world would actually be better off without human beings at all. Or certainly with many less uh, human beings. And in their value system, animals and even insects and in some cases even plants, even the earth itself, must take precedence over human life. That's why at the extreme end of the green movement, you will have violence and even murder in the name of animals, in the name of the environment, in the name of the seas and the earth. Now again, let me reiterate, the Bible is very clear. Man is responsible for the world. Man is not to abuse the world. Don't mishear me. But it is also very, very clear that the world, the earth, is created for man. Man is not the cancer on creation, but the crown of God's creation. And that purpose also dictates the way that the Bible re reveals the truth about cre uh, creation to us. Genesis 1, the whole thing is laid out, it's presented as a laying out of the prerequisites of an environment for human beings to inhabit, in which they can enjoy their purpose, which is to reflect God in his sovereign rule, as his images, as his representatives on earth, and to relate to God, their creator and Lord, as the only creatures, the only ones who are made in his image and therefore capable of uh, relating to him in that way. So if we look at the, the first triad of days there, in, uh, days one to three, we can see that they create time and space uh, and sustenance, the essential elements for human existence. Now, day one, the creation of light, is the creation of time, of day and night. The physicists among you will know that uh, it's beyond me, but Einstein's theories, I think, uh, tell you that same thing. And time is what is essential for what? Well, for the possibility of relationship. We know that. It's the, the obvious mundane sense, isn't it, that building a relationship takes time. Well, if man's chief end is the image of God, is to glorify God, is to enjoy him forever, is to know him in a love relationship. Well, God creates time, which is essential for that to develop and for that to happen. And day two, space, let there be an expanse. Well, again, Einstein and Co. will tell you that these things are inextricably linked, space, time. So there must be space, there must be an essential environment for existence. I give a simple analogy, even a, an expectant mother. What's happening? Well, she's creating space as her baby grows inside her, creating that space to inhabit. He creates time and space. And day three, sustenance, a place to live where sustenance is found, the fruit of all the earth. And all of that is, is clearly presented, you see, as leading towards day six, man's creation, and day seven, his communion with God himself. That's one principal reason, I think, why creation is told according to a weekly timetable. It's because the whole thing is focused on the nature and the purpose of man as God's image. He's created to image God in creation as a workman, 
ruling for God in the world. And day is the realm of man's work. Notice that the first mention of day comes in verse 5. And it certainly here doesn't refer to a 24-hour day. It refers to daylight. Well, what is daylight for? Well, we read it in Psalm 104. When the sun rises, man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. Day is when God works, and so it is for man, the image of God, his workman. And I think that's also why there's such detail in day four, where we're told about the creation of the sun and the moon, that is the lights in the sky. Day four is a very significant place. It's, it's the central day of the seven. Day one creates day for work. Day seven creates the day of rest. But here we are in the middle, and you can see there on the sheet the structure of verses 14 to 17. There's also an intricate parallelism there. And the focus is on the center, on verse 16, on the two great lights, which are there to rule the day and the night. So day and the regulation of day for man is absolutely central to Genesis. That is, they mark out the times and the seasons for man as well. Now, these times and seasons that are referred to there almost certainly are not just talking about spring and summer and things like that, but to Moses' readers, times and seasons would clearly mean the great festivals of Israel, the Passover, the Tabernacles, the Pentecost, and above all, of course, the Sabbath. What are these times and seasons for? They're times and seasons for man's relation to God. God created a world with inbuilt order and rhythm in both space and time, and it's all created and centered upon mankind who are to reflect the perfect rhythms of God, his work and his rest. The day when man works like God, and the day of rest, when man rests and relates with God. So man is to rule, he's to have dominion over all the earth under God, but man doesn't rule the heavens because God puts his great lights in the heavens to rule there, to govern the life of man on earth according to God's timetable, his celestial timetable, to remind man that they're dependent on him, that God is the Lord of time, we're not. And you see, the, the very pattern of that seven-day week is built into creation to remind human beings of that. We only have that by revelation, don't we? We have the months and we have the years, which are inbuilt into the rhythm of the moon and the sun. But we would never know that a week was seven days were it not for the revelation of God here in Scripture, would we? A week could have been 10 days or four days or 17 days. The sun and the moon wouldn't tell us that, but God does. And it tells us, you see, that our chief purpose as human beings lies not just in nature, not just in this creation, but beyond creation in God himself. We're made for worship. So Psalm 90 speaks, doesn't it, about man as being formed from the dust of the earth. But from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart for wisdom. And that wisdom is to understand who we are utterly made for, for the Lord himself. So I think whether you see the days of creation as figurative or indeed whether you uh, want to see them as actual 24-hour periods in which all creation occurred, I agree with Robert Godfrey who says this, they're not a timetable for God's actions, but they're a model timetable for us to follow. God has ordered his creation for man. And in order that man will seek God and know God and rejoice in relationship with God, which is what he was created for. That's what Paul tells the Athenian philosophers, isn't it? Now just think about that for our uh, understanding of our human purpose, of our human identity. Because I think that reveals to us both the dignity of man and also the true destiny uh, of man. The very order of creation with its inbuilt patterns of time, work and rest, day and night, labor and Sabbath, they point us, don't they, to the purpose of all of it, 
that human beings are both to reflect God's nature in the world, in the patterns of our lives, in work and rest, but also, above all, we're created to relate to God, our Creator, to enjoy communion with Him, fellowship with Him in His rest. That's, that's what it means to be truly human. That's what it means to find your true identity, the purpose of your existence on this earth. So there is, to be sure, yes, there is a realm of responsibility and work that is intrinsic to our humanity. That's important. Work is not a necessary evil. That's the way most of us think about it today, isn't it? Well, it's just a means to earn a crust. No, work is what we are made for. Read the book of Proverbs. There's no dignity, is there, for the sluggard. The dignity of work reflecting our maker is what we are made for. But it's not all that we're made for. Because we're made also and above all for God himself to share in his Sabbath rest. We'll have more to say on that next time. But just think for a minute about some of these implications. For one thing, it means we cannot possibly worship our earthly work, can we? As though our earthly work was all important. As though that was made us who we are and what we are. Gives us our identity, our fulfillment. Now there's got to be time for God. And that's true whether you're a student studying, whether you're engrossed in a career, or perhaps whether you're too engrossed in the task of your ministry. And if we need reminding of that, if we need reminding of that relationship with God and that communion with God that is above all what we are made for, God has revealed a weekly pattern so that it is impossible for more than six days of life to go past without the very calendar itself reminding us of the gospel of God, without it reminding us of our calling to stop, to stop looking around at the earth and to look up to God, our maker, to see him for whom we are made. God has ordered his world for man so that we might know God, so that we might find our purpose in him alone. So next time you see the sun, which may be a while here in Glasgow, or next time you see the moon, remember that. That is why the sun and the moon are there. They are there to remind us of God's timetable. They're there to remind us of God's ultimate purpose for us as human beings. They're there to call us to worship God. That is the only reason they're there, according to Genesis chapter 1. Well, perhaps not the only reason. And that does bring us to this last point, which, uh, which will be very brief. But it's very important. God has wor- ordered his world gloriously for mankind. God created not only an essential environment for mankind in which to live and to relate to him. He created an environment of extravagant beauty, of wonder, of sheer delight. In a sense, there's actually no need, is there, for days four to six. Why didn't God just create man on day three? Because there was space and there was time and there was sustenance. The answer surely must be that our God is the God who can do exceedingly abundantly above beyond everything that we can ever even ask or imagine. He is the God of exuberant, overflowing glory. He's the God who always goes further. He gives more. He does more. He's the God of glory, and so his creation is a creation of glory. Let me just summarize in these four words that try to catch something of this glory of creation. Abundance, verse 20. Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and also the birds, and also the animals. And not just once and for all, notice, it goes on and on and on. Verse 22, multiply, fill. It implies go on filling the heavens and the earth. God creates abundantly. He's a God of overflowing generosity. Well, Christian people who are images of his God, what will they be like? It can't be parsimonious people, mean people, niggardly people. Surely we'll be generous people, overflowing with abundance in everything that we do, just like our abundant God. Just like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came, he said he would bring us life, that we might have it abundantly, abundantly. And beauty, look, God is an artist. God's not content with just a mere environment that man can exist in and survive in. 
He decorates it with breathtaking beauty for all the joy and the appreciation of his people. Look at verse 14. Let there be lights for signs and season. Well, there only needed to be one. Could have been a fluorescent tube that went on and off. But this God lights up his handiwork with what? A hundred billion stars in our Milky Way alone and another hundred billion galaxies beyond it. Surely the end of verse 16 must be the most understated clause ever written. And the stars, by the way. The beauty, the sheer loveliness of it all. Just think. We've had this rare good weather, haven't we? Think of the Scottish Highlands in the summer sunshine, the mountains, the rivers, the sea. Think of the world's coastlines and valleys and beautiful things. Think of the diamonds and the rubies and the emeralds and the gold and the silver. Think of just the wonder of sitting by the sea and looking at a sunset over the water. God has given us a beautiful, beautiful home. He's a God of beauty, beauty in abundance. And surely that means that Christian people will be people who love beauty. Who aren't content with the bare and the ugly and the just sufficient. We want to image our beautiful God. Our God will never be a single fluorescent tube and no pictures on the wall kind of God. Our God will always be a halogen downlighter with high color rendition spotlights on every painting that is on the wall. He's a God of abundance and beauty. And of creativity. He not only creates, but do you notice in here how he builds creativity into the very fabric of his creation itself? Verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation. Things have seeds within themselves, so there will be ongoing procreation. Verse 24, let the earth bring forth living creatures. Verse 22, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. It implies going on filling. There's a self-propagating creativity that is set loose in the world and in our humanity verse 28 be fruitful multiply be creative like the creator so surely christians cannot despise creativity in the arts and in architecture and in music and in literature and all of these things sometimes christians have haven't they that's a very great mistake god is an artist He's put it in his world to reflect him. And above all, he's put it in us to reflect him. He wants that creativity to be unleashed, to be appreciated. He wants us to be those who are bringing beauty out of chaos all the time. Of course, it's God's creative pattern that has to dictate to us what really is art, what really is creative. It has form, it has order, it has beauty in abundance, not formless and void. I think a lot of what comes out of modern art, out of an atheistic worldview, is more formless and chaos, isn't it? But with God, there is abundance, there's beauty, there's creativity, and there is diversity, isn't there? That's what their repeated emphasis on separating, uh, I think, speaks of. There's diversity, there's contrasts all through the creation. There's light and dark, there's land and water, there's sunlight and stars, there's male and female, and so on. And I think the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth seems to imply the opportunity for further diversity and richness, to increase and and, and to keep on enriching the created order. And the biologists tell us, don't they, about the almost infinite diversity of the created order, the constant evolving uh, of greater and greater diversity. And that, I think, is what, what Genesis 1 tells us to expect, not... Not mere chance, natural selection, if you like, but God's purpose built into the, re- into the universe, into the creation. God's purpose for a flourishing, organic diversity to go on thrilling us and blessing us. And, of course, notice that it is ordered and limited by God. This diversity grows only within its kind, He says repeatedly, whatever exactly that may mean in relation to our biological classifications and so on, we don't know. And of course, it springs out of an already created order. This is obviously not just that amoebae turn into horses, far less into human beings. 
Not that, but God is, nevertheless, the author of a flourishing diversity. I just think how different that is from atheistic Marxist ideology with its crushing assimilation, its conformity. Those of you who are old enough will remember the ghastly, standardized concrete blocks of Soviet architecture behind the Iron Curtain and so on, gray blocks of bland human similarity. But no, our God is the opposite of that. This is our God. This is his creation. Order out of chaos. Yes, time and space and sustenance for mankind. But also abundance and beauty and creativity and diversity. This is a chapter that is here to proclaim to us the sheer glory of of God's creation. And God himself shouts the message all the way through in case we miss it. Behold, it's good. Did you notice? It's good. It's good. It's very good. God is rejoicing in his works. And you see, in doing so, he's calling us, isn't he, as his images, to join him in that praise, to join in praise of our God, the sheer glory of our God, and the sheer glory of his creation for us, to give us a wonderful home. Well, that's why this chapter's here, I think. And I think the psalmist of Psalm 104 understood that and was right. So let's pray using his words. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke, We will sing to the Lord all our life. We will sing praise to our God as long as we live. May our meditation be pleasing to him as we rejoice in the Lord. Help us, Lord, to rejoice in the glory and in the sheer goodness of all that you've made. And help us to rejoice in you above all, our sovereign Lord, our great Savior, so that we will live before you as you would have us live. To the praise of Jesus Christ, the Lord of creation, our Lord and our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.